how do we bear one another's burdens? It's an important question. It's a vital question. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We we see um, a statement, a what we should be doing clause there. Bear one another's burdens. And we see um, a, a why and so fulfill the law of Christ. How do we fulfill the law of Christ? Well, there's a how that goes back to the initial statement. Bear one another's burdens. So if you desire to fulfill the law of Christ, you ought to be bearing one another's burdens. But what exactly does that mean? Is it really as simple as accompanying one another to the shops or something and just, you know, taking someone's bag for them? Is it That sort of burden, I think we know that while that can be a nice thing, um, depending on the need of the individual, that is not what Paul is getting at. He he is getting at something much deeper um, in this passage. He's not talking about um, a probably light or physical load. He is talking about a very deep Um, spiritual load, a a burden that is um, present in an individual, perhaps in a practical way, perhaps in a spiritual way, um, a mental way, a psychological way even, um, perhaps. There there could be many different burdens of which he is speaking. Um, If you were to delve deeper into the um, original language and the sense of this passage, it's implying that there will be some burdens that are easier than others and there will be a variation in the type of burden that you will bear. So there will be some burdens that you're going to be able to come alongside someone and help them with um, with much joy and gladness and it will be a thrill. It will be something that you're you're very happy to help with and then there are some very um, well less positive burdens some negative burdens some sadnesses, some griefs some anxieties, some pains uh, some burdens that you're going to need to, to bear that are a struggle, that are a grief to yourself, to your own soul, that are exhausting, that are painful, um, and and that cause, uh, to some degree, that can cause a degree of consternation and frustration. So how can we bear one another's burdens? How do we bear one another's burdens? It's very significant. If you desire to please Christ... You need to fulfill Christ's law. What is Christ's law? Well, specifically, it's believed that Christ's law is referring to um, Christ's own statement as to what the law is that we should be keeping. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. In the context here, we see he is particularly talking about um, this law, certainly, but at the same time, in a very focused way in regards to one another in the church body. Now, bear with me as we look at um, several several points here this morning. Uh, there are um, s- several ideas that we need to consider, and hopefully we'll sense a logical um, progression Um, And we'll have some clarity by God's grace. Uh, First of all, we bear one another's burdens through Christ-centered, Christ-led commitment. Christ-centered commitment. Why is Paul writing this letter to the churches in Galatia? Is it really any of his business? What the churches are going through. Is it really any of Paul's concern that these churches have fallen into an unhelpful attitude of isolationism, cynicism, uh, pessimism, and legalism? Is it, is it any of his concern? I mean, really, who, who does Paul think he is? Sure, he's an apostle. Sure, he's been specifically called by God. Sure, he is been. He's been given a task and a responsibility for numerous churches, but he, he is not Jesus. Who is he to judge? Well, Paul's not judging um, unfairly. Paul is discerning what is right and wrong, and he's, he's, he's encouraging these believers in Galatia to do what is right, to take the right way. He is stirring them up to love and good works. 
which is what we as believers are called to do. But why is it any of his business? Again, uh, Paul understands what Christian commitment is. He understands what it looks like to commit to one another as part of the body of Christ. He knows what that means on a universal scale. There's a sense of responsibility that Paul has for many churches that he has helped plant. Many churches where there are many individuals that he knows. Um, if you were to look at the, um, the last chapters of 1 Corinthians, I believe. Actually, rather, it's 2 Corinthians. Um, last chapter of 2 Corinthians. He describes his sufferings and his persecution. And in a ways. He's answering this same question to the people at Corinth. They're already asking, what concern is it to you? Uh, who are you to be challenging us on our sin? Uh, the sins he noted in 1 Corinthians. And so he goes through and describes um, everything that basically gives him some credibility. And in verse 28, in addition to all of these horrific ordeals that Paul has been through, he says, apart from... Other things, verse 28 of 2 Corinthians 11. There is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. So Paul is concerned for many churches. Churches that he has had a hand in planting. People whom he's had a hand in discipling. But this idea of commitment and church, isn't it a bit outdated? And does it really matter whether one is committed in a church environment or not. Well, first of all, the letter to the Galatians is not addressed to one church. It is addressed to many churches. Um, in verse 1 and 2, Paul gives his opening address. He speaks of how he's an apostle, not from men nor through man, verse 1 of chapter 1, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Galatia was a province, and there were many churches in this province. And Galatia is one of six regions of churches, local churches, that are mentioned in the New Testament. There are 33 individual local churches that are referenced specifically by name in the New Testament. That's quite significant. And it shows us that this idea of the local church is actually a New Testament idea. This is not something that is uh, third or fourth century. It is not something that is medieval by any means. It's not something from the last century. Local church and local church commitment has been around since the time of our Lord Jesus Christ ascension into heaven and the establishment of the church in Jerusalem. The church being faithful to go into all the world at this stage, in this place, to many different towns in Galatia. So local church commitment is important. You can bear one another's burdens by getting stuck in to your local church. But why? Again, well, it in one way should be self-explanatory. Um, it, it, it makes sense. It's reasonable to understand that when you are stuck into a local grouping of people, you get to know one another. You get to know one another. You know who is a part of the church. You know who is not a part of the church. You get to know one another's um, good side. You also... Um, get to know those annoying tendencies about each other. That's part of family life. Not everything is going to make you happy. Not everything is going to make you feel awesome and great inside. There are occasions that you'll be slightly put off. You'll be a little irked. You might get miffed on occasion. But the reality is, this is a part of family life. Paul addresses these people, people with whom he's already displayed a great amount of frustration. Uh, if, you, if you read the letter in its entirety, the, the frustration is unavoidable. You, you will um, 
possibly even feel quite awkward um, yourself reading it and convicted, hopefully, um, as well. I mean, that, that, that was the idea. This isn't a warm and fuzzy um, part of the New Testament by any means. It's, it's challenging. It's hard-hitting. But Paul is addressing this as, um, in some ways, a, um, a father sort of figure to these people. At the same time, here, he addresses them as brothers. So he's actually on an equal plane with them. He's saying, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Brothers. So he's addressing the Christians in the churches in Galatia. That signifies that Paul has an understanding that these individuals have committed to one another in their churches. Um, In the end of Romans, you will read uh, a list of names. And Paul just goes through loads of people's names. He says, greet this person. Speak to this person. And tell this person this for me. And that list of names shows that there is a personal nature to Paul's ministry. He's not, he's not in this for prestige. He's not in this for um, any sort of um, you know, following. He views these people as family. And at the end of Romans, it's clear these people are all known to one another. They know one another. If you know one another, you're better able to bear one another's burdens. But if you are someone whose Christian life is in one way continuously reflected by dipping in and dipping out, going to and fro, your ability to bear other people's burdens is significantly and severely limited. There was... uh, one individual who I, I met um, once who I believe visited um, several years ago a church I was involved in and she said she didn't want to commit to any church rather she just liked going around to different churches each week encouraging them and I suggested to her that in one way, she might want to ask the other pastors what, what their thinking was, but that for her own benefit, she should get stuck in into one church and also for those churches' benefits because it, it, it's not an encouragement. Speaking as a pastor, it's not an encouragement when people are not bearing one another's burdens. I am not called to bear everyone's burden on my own. I have burdens that need to be borne as well. And we'll get there in a few moments. But the reality is, um, I am not the guy who holds everything together. Christ holds everything together with his spirit. The Holy Spirit works and in us. But sadly, in churches, so often it's a case of we come in, we go out, we come next Sunday maybe, or, or we can go over there and maybe encourage them. It, it's not actually encouraging. It's actually discouraging. Because when I see individuals who are not committed, I see people who are wondering and not finding a place to settle down. I see people who um, don't want to commit to other people. I see a situation where there, there may be a, it seems as though there possibly is, an ongoing spiritual warfare, an ongoing spiritual battle where the individual has come to an understanding that it's okay to believe in Jesus without fulfilling his law. You aren't bearing one another's burdens if you do not commit to one another and get stuck in and know one another and operate as a family. That's why, you know, if we can use this term, the vision for our, the church here in Angel is that we be a family. That we know one another. So if ever there's a case where where you see someone you don't know that person, get to know them. Get to know each other. Bear one another's burdens. Pray for one another. 
Christ-centered, Christ-led commitment is crucial for the sake of responsibility and accountability. I am responsible. If I'm not committed to this church, you do not know what my issues are. And if I fall into any transgression, you cannot restore me. What's more, you do not know whether I've fallen into any transgression. Because I'm, I'm, I'm not committed. And I'm not getting stuck in. I'm not staying with you guys. So I, I'm, I'm here, but I'm also here and here and here. No one really knows who I am. No one really knows about me. No one really knows my struggles. And I'm fine with that because I don't want to be held accountable. I want to live my Christian life um, in the church. I, I come into the church, and it's like those of us who went to the conference the other week, we were told to wear a name badge. I don't really like name badges. I don't know why. Probably um, my, my dad never liked them, so it may be something genetic. But um, I, I, I don't like name badges, but I had to wear a name badge. And, um, you know, at the end of it, I was, I was talking with, with Lewis about this. I said a name badge um, in, in one way is very much how people treat Christianity. We treat Christianity like it's a name badge to put on and to take off. We have the name badge on when we're in the church. We put on our, um, our, our, our badge which says, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm wearing my name badge. And you see that I'm a Christian because my name badge is here. I'm here. I'm a Christian. And then I walk out. I turn the corner. And just sort of look around. And I take the name badge off. And I put it in my pocket for the next week. That's, that's messed up. That's wrong. Uh, L- Lewis um, gave me a good illustration. Um, he did cite his source. Uh, I believe Leo um, has, has spoken of um, speed camera Christianity. Everyone who drives a car here probably knows where this is headed. Have you ever, when you see the sign that says there's a speed camera coming up, intentionally slowed down, and then as soon as you're past the speed camera, you you go back up five miles or so over the speed limit, or you feel comfortable doing that? Well, people treat Christianity like that, and we're just trucking along, speeding along, up, church time, time to cool everything down, and behave as Christians again. That's not Christianity. Christianity is not something that you engage in on a day or at a specific time. Worship is not for an hour on Sundays or two hours or three hours or however long. It's a life. It's a life. And you need to ask yourself, are you living that life? Are you living that life in a responsible way, accountable to one another. Do you have a brother or sister in Christ who you can go to and say, I've sinned in this way and it's plaguing my conscience. I just really don't know what to do. Do you have a brother and sister in Christ who you know you can go to? Do you have a church that you belong to that you can go to and say, look, this is the situation. I've really messed up here. I need help. And you're confident that there will be restoration and renewal, that you'll have people respond with a spirit of gentleness, love, and grace, no matter what's happened? I pray you do. I pray you will if you don't. Because this is part of the Christian life. If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. True spiritual maturity is indicated in evidence through Christ-centered and Christ-led commitment, responsibility, accountability that leads to restoration, renewal, and stirs one another up to righteousness. But linked in with this, there's the importance of Christ-enlightened clarity. What exactly defines a Christian brother? What defines a Christian church? What defines transgressing against God's word? What defines restoration? What defines our lives as Christians? 
well, what's the definition of all of that? Really, you, you can't bear other people's burdens unless you are confident in the truth which you profess. You can't bear one another's burdens unless you're actually clear on who the chief burden bearer is. The chief burden bearer being our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who took our sins upon himself. I was talking with a friend recently about this big Bible word, propitiation. Propitiation, it can't be worded any other way and just one word. Uh, it's a unique concept which speaks of um, one standing in place taking punishment for the sake of satisfying another party. In this case, Jesus Christ standing on our behalf in front of God the Father taking God's justice and wrath, holiness and pu punishment against sin on himself. Jesus Christ stands and takes the wrath of God on himself. And my friends, that's a dangerous concept. That's a dangerous concept. Well, in one way it is. It, it cost Jesus his life. He was crucified. Yes, it's dangerous. At the same time, it's dangerous perhaps in that one could think, oh, Jesus took the punishment for me. I can just coast through the Christian life. I'll just coast along. You know, I believe in Jesus. He took the punishment um, that I deserved. Now I can coast along and do what I want to do. And many people have that belief. But if you read the Bible, if you read particularly, I'm thinking of Romans, if you read Galatians, it's going to be very clear that propitiation and Jesus Christ taking punishment on our behalf is not an excuse that gives us this thought that anything goes. Because propitiation actually, when Jesus takes punishment on our behalf, inspires us to love God more, to love one another more, to love the lost more, and to do good all the more. We're not saved by good works, but Ephesians 2 tells us very clearly in no uncertain terms, we are saved for good works. Good works were created by God. We are God's workmanship. We have been born again that we should walk in His way of good works. Read Ephesians 2 verse 10. That clarifies everything there. Uh, Christ's enlightened clarity is crucial, but you cannot bear one another's burdens unless you can... Speak with the straightforward confidence of Paul unless you know who your brothers are. Paul has people in mind here. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, what's a transgression? It's sin against God. But what's sin against God? Well, he clarified what those things are of the flesh, what those sinful things are um, that plague us on a daily basis in temptation in verse 19 of the previous chapter. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. You know, your conscience should be screaming at you if you are engaging in any of these works. If, if, if it's not, then your conscience may be seared. You may have deadened your conscience. But what's the opposite of transgression? Well, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The former things go against the law of Christ. They have nothing to do with bearing burdens. Rather, they stack up the baggage on you. They stack up that, that load of sin that you bear, that I bear without Christ. We need Christ's enlightened clarity. We need to look to God and His Word for understanding what defines a Christian. Is it just someone who says, I'm a Christian, or is it someone who actually is living the life? Uh, it, it, what, what exactly is a church? Is it anything that says it's a church, a Christian church? Or is it a grouping of people that have covenanted together 
for the sake of giving Christ glory, being enlightened in His Word, for the sake of reaching the lost, preparing for Christ coming again. Sadly, we live in a world where so much is perverted, so much has been twisted, and there is a very grave reality and a real sense in which we need clarity all the more. There's no clarity in the world today. Everything is fluid and everything is changing. And yet the Lord gives us assurance in his word. He says, I, the Lord, do not change. So in a world that is constantly changing, how wonderful it is to know that our Lord does not change. And in a world where everything seems fickle and frail and is, is going in a cycle all of the time and fads and trends come and go and come and go, right and wrong and the definition of what's right and what's wrong seems to always be changing, right the center of it all, it, our Lord never changes. He is concrete. His word is concrete. So rely on Him. Be clear. Turn to Christ and you will receive His light. You need clarity so that you can know that there are some people you can address as brothers and there are some who are not. There are some who are genuine believers and followers of Jesus Christ, genuine disciples and and those who are not. You need clarity as to what defines a church. It's not just what you, it's not just what you make it. You know, we're in a society that says, "Oh, it's, it's what you make of it. It's what you make it. It's what you want it to be." Well, no. By definition, it can't be. First of all, church is a gathering. By definition, it's a gathering. Sunagage is the word in the original language. It means coming together, gathering together. So at a basic sense, we are coming together. We are gathering together. We are a gathering. Uh, In a deeper sense, we see um, throughout the New Testament and the teaching of Christ and the apostles, uh, a church gathers together with specific um, vision towards Christ. To making Christ known, to living out Christ, and to doing exactly what we're getting at today. To bear one another's burdens in the Christian walk. But in order to do this, we need to know who we are as Christians. We need to know our Savior all the more. We need to know what pleases our Savior, what displeases Him. We need to know uh, what response and role the church has in each other's lives and in in the life, um, ongoing system of this world. Without that clarity, we cannot bear one another's burdens. Without commitment, we cannot bear one another's burdens. And third, we, we need to have Christ-mindful consideration and care. Christ-mindful consideration and care. Uh, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Keep watch on yourself. You need to be considerate and take care as to where you are and as to what you are doing. You are responsible before God. You are responsible. In verse 3, if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Pride is a massive struggle. It's a massive battle. And it must be fought against. When, uh, the, the reality is, if we think we are something, we are deceiving ourselves. In and of ourselves, before God, we are, the word the expression Paul uses in regards to the Ephesians before they had Christ, was dead in trespasses and sin. Yes, we're made in God's image. And yes, that's a beautiful thing. That's a great reality. But you can't very well reflect Christ. You can't do anything with the image in which you were created if you were dead in your trespasses and sin. All of us have had family members die. All of us have had a loved one die. And 
you know, I, I remember when um, my grandfather died. Um, I remember that I did not I did not see my grandfather for the last year and a half or two years of his life. My family had moved here uh, in 2003, and um, I remember the last time I saw my grandfather at Pizza Hut um, celebrating my sister's birthday. Um, that was the day before we, um, we left. Actually, it was the same day we left um, to, to move here. Uh, situations came up, and it, it, it hindered our family from being able to go back to the States for a significant period of time. My grandfather became very ill. Uh, his Alzheimer's kicked into overdrive through a stroke, and his Parkinson's was um, yeah, presenting a lot of real difficulties. And eventually, he succumbed to pneumonia. And so I, I remember uh, the time I last saw him, and then the time I, I saw him for the last time before he was buried as he was in his coffin. And he wasn't my grandfather as I knew him. He, he was not, he did not have the same image even, in a ways. That he, he was not talking, he was not laughing. There was no personality. He was in his body, physically dead. The reality is before God, we are spiritually dead. There's no life. We're just, we're just there. We're living life without a purpose, without a fulfillment of the God-given personality which we have that is to be used for reflecting God's image. And that's very sad. We need to keep careful watch on ourselves. We need to watch over each other. Uh, if anyone is caught in any transgression, that, that implies a daily interaction in people's lives to some extent. That, that there's, there's knowledge of what's going on. There's an openness, a transparency, an honesty with one another. It's not about prying. It's not about you know, um, being a, a nuisance and um, getting into other people's business. There are, there are passages against meddling and meddlers, people who just dabble in other people's business that's, that, that's not theirs. But there's a real degree of transparency and honesty in the body of Christ. And there is that for the sake of accountability. It's part of commitment and covenanting together to give God glory uh, and proclaiming our Savior. So we need to consider one another. We need to be considerate of one another. Philippians 2.3 um, speaks of thinking more highly of others than we do ourselves. He, he, he warns us against thinking much of ourselves here in Galatians 6. We don't need to be alone. What he, he's saying here is each one test his own work. We need to review ourselves. We need to watch over ourselves. Then it says, then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. At the same time, he's already said, bear one another's burdens. So you need to keep watch on yourself and you need to be willing to bear your own load. But at the same time, you need to be willing for someone else to come alongside you and help you bear your load. And you also need to go alongside others and help them bear their load. Whatever struggle, whatever situation they are going through, it can be simple and small, or it can be very great and large. You, 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 this is part of loving one another as Christ has loved us. It, it puts others first. He, he speaks of the care which ought to be given to those who um, are, are teachers and ministers in the church. In verse 6, one who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Now, it was said by one of the um, reformers back in the uh, medieval age, it is and always has been the disposition of the world to freely bestow on the ministers of Satan, every luxury 
and hardly to supply godly pastors with necessary food. That was the situation in the medieval ages and for many in the world today. That's the situation right now. There are people who are laboring hard, who are working hard, who are not provided for. I am thankful for you as, as my church in that you have faithfully loved and provided for my needs. I'm thankful for that. There are other churches that, that haven't done that. There are other Christians who they take and receive the spiritual food they're given. And, and the pastor is just so, you know, he, 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 he has it easy. He, he, just, he just opens up God's word and, you know, he visits people and stuff. But there's a complete lack of understanding as to what goes on. And some have encouraged um, individuals who doubt the daily life or the role of a pastor to, to shadow just to see what their life is like on a daily basis. And I've heard how that's been to great benefit for many. Um, the reality is there must be care for one another and there must be care for those who are pastoring and leading in the church. Consider each other. Care for each other. In doing this, you're conforming to the will of our Lord. He's, he says in... Verse 9, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. This leads us to the final point, which we need to consider, and that's we need to bear one another's burdens through Christ exalting consistency. Get stuck in. Continue to love one another and care for one another and put uh, each other first in the light of Christ. And be consistent. Don't be inconsistent in this endeavor. Don't, don't be going to and fro, always leaving those who care for you, wondering where you are spiritually. Don't always be wondering after some truth or after some knowledge, but never arriving at the truth. Don't always be going just to and fro. Uh, the image used elsewhere by Paul is like little children tossed about on waves, or blown about by every wind of doctrine is what, how Paul puts it. He, he's, he's saying if you have a child and you put them in the sea, don't follow it to the logical conclusion, uh, but the child is going to be tossed back and forth by the waves. It's not going to be a good scenario. So why then do we live our lives without stability, without settling down and getting stuck in and striving towards the call of our Savior by holding one another responsible and accountable in the local church. I believe it's because we fear, we're afraid. We, we actually like the old man, which we were to put off, which Ephesians speaks of, we actually know there's too much or there is a level of sin in us that we don't want others to know about. But, but guess what? You're not alone. You are not alone. We all are in this struggle together. And because we are all in this struggle together, we should stand together. Scriptures use the Christian life um, and illustrate it as like a battleground, a war that we are waging. And you have the full armor of God, which you're to put on. If you read the last chapter in Ephesians, um, you'll, you'll understand what that's about. But you, you also are a part of an army of God's people. A good soldier doesn't just run off and you know, do his own thing. A good soldier is coordinated. A good soldier looks out for his comrade. A good soldier sees his brother on the ground hurt. 
What does he do? If he's a good soldier, he picks his brother up, puts his arm over his shoulder, bears his burden, and gets him to safety. That's a good soldier. And yet, the Christian life, we have people who fall, and you know, we're fighting on the same side. What, what do we do? It's like, oh, he's fallen. We give a kick. It's like, oh, waste of space, waste of time. This guy's always tripping up over himself, always getting shot at. You know, he just doesn't come out equipped. Oh, and look, he's, he's left his weaponry, and his, he's not even wearing his body armor. He got what was coming to him, and we, we give another kick. That's not how it's supposed to be. To be united. Or to bear one another's burdens. Or to fulfill the law of Christ. We're, we're to realize that were it not for God's grace, we also would fall. And we're to be aware and to keep watching ourselves lest we too be tempted. Unless we too fall. So bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens through Christ-centered, Christ-led commitment. Ask yourself the question, you know, are you stuck in? Are you stuck in and committed to a body of believers that you can love and that will love you, that's proclaiming Christ's word, that will challenge you, that will stimulate you to growth and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Are you clear? Are, are, are you, do you have Christ-enlightened clarity? Or, or do you get a lot of what you know? Or have you gotten a lot of what you know just from other sources? Media, books, self-help guides. You know, there, there's, there's some stuff out there that is good. I'm not going to disclaim that. But there's a lot of stuff that's not. And the reality is that the word of the Lord has everything we need for life and godliness. It's profitable for training, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. That's, if, if you want to know what is right before God and if you want to have a blank slate, turn to Jesus Christ he will cleanse you of your sin. Turn to Jesus Christ and get stuck into a body of believers. You will grow in clarity. I don't have it all straight. I, I'm looking now uh, just, you know, and everything sometimes when I look in the scriptures is hazy. It's, it's foggy. Paul said the same thing. He said, we now look into a mirror and it's all dim. Basically, a mirror in the days of Paul was um, either through reflection on water or very often just a, a, a very heavily polished um, piece of metal, generally copper. And if you have ever looked into reflection in water or into a piece of copper, you can't really see your reflection all that clear. We're always going to be that way, but it gets a bit clearer. And then Jesus comes again and we see clearly as we never have before. Are you clear? Are you considerate and caring of one another? And are you consistent? The, there's, in the original language, the um, charge to bear one another's burdens is a present imperative. It means it's a command that's ongoing. It's consistent. It, it means this is an ongoing reality. It's, it will define your Christian life. Bear one another's burdens. Um, the same with share. Share all good things with the one who is, is teaching, that, that's an ongoing reality. Test your own work. Again, that's present imperative. Review yourself. Test yourself. Just ask yourself. Qu question yourself sometimes. It's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing just to look and to see, am I doing this right? And if there's a lack of confidence and a lack of clarity, go in prayer to God's word. And go because you are responsible and accountable to those brothers and sisters who you've committed to. This is crucial. This is how we bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I pray that this will be something that is evidenced in our lives as Christians. It's evidenced in the life of this local church for God's glory.
Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for your truth. We pray that it would deeply impact us and that you would conform us to the image of our Savior, Jesus Christ, for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.